And so to remind us about that, we've given everybody a $2 bill. So now I, I realize that some of you hadn't heard of any of this before, but those of you that have, how many got your $2 bill with you today? Like that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I told you when I gave those to you, I said, now, this is not magic. This is just a reminder. This is to remind us all the time that we're not satisfied with the average. We want a double portion. That's why we carry these $2 bills with us. But I said, you might have an occasion to, to spend them. I've actually spent some of my $2 bills, and I'd have to go replenish. And some of our people have done the same thing. They have spent it. And because when I do spend it, then I can say to the person that's taking that, you, you ever go to a cash register, you give them a $2 bill, and they look at you like, what am I supposed to do with that? I've got a place here in my register for ones, fives, tens, twenties. I don't have a place for a $2 bill. But so it gets their attention, and you can say to them, well, this is all about we're trusting God for a double portion. It gives you a chance to give a little testimony. But I'm mentioning this today. I need to, I need to replenish uh, Keith's $2 bill. Keith, I want you to come up here and explain how you lost your $2 bill and so that people can kind of get an under, a better understanding about how this $2 bill thing is all, what it's all about. See if we can turn that on for you. I'm giving you another one. All right, thank you. Well, I uh, they changed my route at work, so now I'm having to go to Oklahoma City Tuesday through Saturday night to the airport to pick up, or to actually to take mail and deliver it. Well, Friday night, no. Yeah, Friday, uh, Friday morning, I was on my way back from Oklahoma City, and I stopped at the Love Station there in Chandler to take a little break, and so I walked in, and this young lady named Jessie greeted me, and she said, how are you doing, sir? I said, oh, I am great. I am doubly blessed and ask her how she's doing, and her response was, well, you know, I'm living the dream, just working hard to barely get by. So I went on to the restroom. Well, while I was gone, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me about giving her my $2 bill and explained that I live under the double blessing and that I was going to pray that God, through this $2 bill, that the double blessing would come upon her. So I gave it to her, and she began to cry. And she's like, you're making me cry. And I'm like, well, I'm just doing what God told me to do. Well. That morning when I got home, Deborah had gotten up and we prayed for her. Well, Saturday morning when I came back through and stopped to take a break, I saw her and she was beaming. So I asked her, I said, Jesse, are you blessed? She goes, I sure am. As soon as you gave me that $2 bill, I put it in my pocket, and the Lord began to deal with me about my life and how I need to turn my life back around. And she said, before my shift was over, I resurrendered my life to Christ. <laughs> so not only was it a double blessing, but she came back to the Lord all because of my obedience to give her the $2 bill. So now I have another one yeah. that I can give out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so we, we just try and remind you that this is all about the Lord putting a double blessing on you, but you have, you have been blessed to be a blessing. 
The Lord isn't building any lakes. He's building rivers. And we just want to be a place that the Holy Spirit can flow through us. Can you say amen to that? Praise God. Uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you just a little bit here today. Um, usually I try to preach. I'm going to share with you today. Um, you, you say, what's the difference? You'll know when I'm through today what's the difference. Um, but I want to talk to you today about three eternal truths. These are the most important things that you can know and believe, these three eternal truths. And the first one is that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Son of God. That, that is so important. You know, we're living in a, a period of time when other people feel free to take our words and redefine them. So... We, years ago, if you asked somebody, now some of you may not have even lived in this dispensation, but in, in my early lifetime, if you asked somebody, are you a Christian? Then they knew what you were asking them. You knew what you were asking them. And they would give you an answer kind of based on, you, you'd be on the same level of understanding. You meant by that, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him? If you are a Christian, have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sins? And are you trying to live your life according to the teachings of Jesus Christ? All of that was included in that one simple question, are you a Christian? But today, the answer to that question can be based on a lot of different things maybe having nothing to do with a personal experience with Jesus whatsoever. Someone might say that they're a Christian because they believe in uh, Jesus, that he did live, that he existed. Historically, they believe in Jesus, so then they're a, a Christian. Somebody thinks that they're a Christian because many years ago they prayed a prayer, repeat after me. Now, by the way, that's a very good place to begin your Christian walk. For someone to lead you in a prayer of repentance and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a starting place. But we're talking about living a life committed to Christ when we ask the question, are you a Christian? Not have you prayed a prayer one time in history, but are you living for Jesus? That's what we're asking. But people's answer can be uh, a lot of different things. In fact, there are huge religious orders, I, will, I call them cults, who profess to be Christian. Their problem is they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They do not believe that he is the only Son of God. Somebody says, oh yeah, he's the Son of God, and I am too, and so is everybody else. We're all the sons of God. If that's what you believe, that Jesus is the same in the same regard a Son of God as you are, you are not a Christian in the sense that we would are asking when we said, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? It's not the same thing. And so just because someone says they're a Christian, that doesn't get to the, to the, the foundation if they believe what I called a minute ago, these eternal truths. Because what we're referring to is that we believe that the historical man 2,000 years ago that lived in uh, Nazareth, came from the city of Nazareth, and ministered throughout uh, the, the region of, of Israel, that he was not just a prophet, that he was not just a teacher, he was not just a good example, but he in fact was the very living, only begotten Son of God. He was born of God and, in fact, is God. And, and that's important to know, not just know, well, that's what the church teaches, but know it's a literal fact that God became flesh and lived among men in the person of Jesus 
of Nazareth. And so there are folks that would dispute, well, did Jesus ever say he was the Son of God? Did, I want to tell you, and I want you to understand clearly. Uh, someone said, well, Jesus was a good man. I don't know about him being the Son of God. Listen to me. If Jesus was not the Son of God, he is not a good man. If he's not the Son of God, he is a liar and a deceiver. He must be the Son of God or else he is a, the, the greatest con man in all of history. But don't worry about those terrible things I said. He's not a con man. He is, in fact, literally God made flesh. And we know this because, first of all, the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter number 9 that Jesus forgave sin. And uh, on this occasion, a crippled man, a, 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 a paralyzed, man paralyzed, was brought to Jesus and, and lowered through a roof down to the house where Jesus was because they couldn't get in the crowd. And Jesus stepped up to that man and seeing his faith, and the faith of the four men that lowered him down through this roof, Jesus' first response was, your son sins are forgiven. And when he spoke those words, all of his critics absolutely lost their mind. Who is this who, who forgives sin? Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he said to them, well, what do you think is easier, to say to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to this man, rise up and take your bed and walk. And then he said, so you can know, Jesus said this, so that you can know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He said to that paralyzed man on the stretcher, rise, take up your bed and walk. And this man that was not able to move when he came to Jesus rolled out of that bed, rolled up the cot, put it on his shoulder, and walked out of that house. Jesus showed he not only had the power to forgive sin, but to heal the paralytic because he is the Son of God. Second reason we know that Jesus is the Son of God <clears throat> is because he accepted worship. Now you may remember that the Apostle Paul came into a city and the first thing he was confronted with a, a man with a major illness and in the name of Jesus laid his hands on that man and he was immediately healed. And when that happened, the people of the city was so shocked and surprised by what Paul did. He did it under the authority of Jesus' name, but when they saw what Paul did, they considered him a miracle worker and a god. And so immediately they began to bring animals and to, to set them on an altar and to do sacrifice, worshiping the apostles. And Paul refused to let them do that. I, I, do not do that. You might also remember that a man by the name of Cornelius wasn't, was not a believer. He, he was not a Christian. He prayed. He did good deeds, but he did not know Jesus as his Savior. And as he was praying, the Lord, showing mercy on him, sent an angel to him, told him to send for, uh, for uh, Simon Peter. And um, so they sent for Simon Peter. When he came to his house, immediately Cornelius was overwhelmed. This man that God had given him a and a vision about. He, he had come to his house to give him the words of life. And so he fell down on his knees in front of, Paul, of uh, Peter and was, was worshiping Peter. And Peter stopped him. You don't, don't worship me. I'm just a man. You don't worship men. You don't worship apostles. And not only that, you don't worship angels. Now, this is a little bit hard to believe. I think we read through this in the book of Revelation and we don't even notice it. I think we just read right through it. But John, you know, John is the revelator. He is the apostle who wrote the book of Revelation. But two times, two different times, as the revelation, the vision, 
is unfolding before John the Revelator, he meets an angel and he's overwhelmed at the glory of that moment. And John made the mistake of bowing down to worship these angels. And both times those angels rebuked him and said, don't do that. Don't worship me. Worship only God. Only God, only God uh, is eligible to receive worship. And yet when Jesus came riding on a donkey on Palm Sunday into the city of Jerusalem, and those who followed him began to take off their coats and throw it on the road to make an impromptu red carpet for him to come into town. And they began to cut off palm branches and wave them in the air in front of Jesus as he's riding that donkey into town. And they're crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! The Son of David was a Jewish terminology that was referring to the Messiah. They were recognizing Jesus as the Messiah and they're waving their palm branches in the air. And again, the critics of Jesus speak up and say, Master! Rebuke your disciples. Rebuke them because they're worshiping you. But Jesus said, I say, I'm going to tell you the truth. He said, if these people would hold their peace, immediately the rocks would cry out and worship me. Now, do you understand the point of what I'm saying to you today? Do you get this? I want you to get this because I'm not just filling space here today. I'm telling you one of the most important things that you could know and one of the three essential things that you must know, that is that Jesus of Nazareth was not just a great man. He was not just a great teacher. He was not just a prophet and a miracle worker. But Jesus of Nazareth was the only begotten Son of God and in fact was God. He, he, was, um, he, he forgave sins, and he accepted worship. And listen to this third thing. This happened twice in Jesus' earthly ministry. When Jesus entered the ministry, he was baptized by John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist didn't understand why Jesus wanted to be baptized because Jesus didn't have anything to be forgiven of. He was not being baptized for the repentance of sin. All of the rest of the people that John the Baptist ever baptized was repenting of their sins, but not Jesus. Instead, Jesus was being baptized to launch his public ministry. Up till now, he had been preparing, but now he's launching his public ministry. And when he came up out of the water, two things happened. One of them was that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in a visible form, looked like a dove, flew down from heaven and landed on Jesus. That was one thing that happened. But the other thing that happened was that there was a voice that came out of heaven. And that voice said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That happened on that occasion, and most people are aware of that, but something happened later in Jesus' life, actually only a few hours before he was crucified. It's uh, recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter number 12, and verse 28. On that occasion, when Jesus was having his last meeting with his disciples before he would be crucified, he said to the Father in prayer, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, Father, glorify your name. And the Father said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. That voice came audibly from heaven that, that stamped an approval on the ministry of Jesus during his entire ministry now it reaches its climax and, and the Father stamps his approval on the life of Jesus at that point. Now, if you think that that might have been an insignificant event, 
Let me tell you about Peter, the mighty apostle. The mighty apostle says to us, the church, he said, Peter speaking to us, he says, I want you to know that we were not declaring unto you cleverly devised fables when we shared with you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his glory and we heard the voice. That voice is what changed Peter's life. He said, we've heard the voice. When God the Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. When the Father said, I've glorified your name, I'm glorifying it again. Peter said, we heard it. We're eyewitnesses. And gave the stamp of the approval with his life, his life testimony, that Jesus was in fact the Son of God and was in, the only begotten Son of God and was in fact God himself. That is, that is one of the most important things you'll ever hear. And it is one of those eternal truths that's, that's essential to your own eternal life, that Jesus is the Son of God. Second one is that the Bible is the eternal authority in everything, and it will be the basis of final judgment. You know, the, uh, Islam has a belief in, judge, in the day of judgment. They believe that everybody's going to stand before God. They're right about that. Everybody is. But they've got the wrong idea about how they will be judged. In Islam, the Muslims believe that everyone will stand before Allah and all their good deeds are going to be put in one side of a balanced scale. And it will be weighed against all their bad deeds. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, they will go into heaven. But if the bad deeds outweigh the good deeds, according to Islam, those people that then go into hell. I'm glad to tell you that that is wrong. I'm glad to tell you that's wrong. I, I don't ever have to worry about, when I share the gospel with somebody, about whether or not it's possible for them to get enough good deeds in their life to outweigh their bad deeds. I don't care how bad they've been, I can say to every one of them, if you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will uh, confess your sin, repent of them, Jesus will forgive you right now. He will forgive you right now and you'll never be faced with these sins of the past again because he'll bear them in the sea of forgetfulness. I can say that to everybody and it doesn't matter how bad they've been or how long they've been bad because the way of salvation is different than that. We do not earn our way to be saved, never could. I want you to know Jesus asked the Father when he was about to be crucified, he said to the Father, Father, if there is any way that men can be saved without me drinking this cup, then let this cup pass from me. And the fact that the Father allowed Jesus to die the death that he died is evidence that there was no other way. Only through the death of Jesus, only through his shed blood can anybody be saved. But further than that, no one else can be saved in any other manner. It's only through the life and the death of Jesus. As it is recorded um, in, in the scriptures that the, the Bible has indicated the plan of salvation and that there is no other way. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse 16, Paul is talking to Timothy about the Holy Scriptures, and he says, all Scripture, if you've got a copy of your Bible, I know a lot of you bring your Bibles on your cell phones, which is fine, or your, or your uh, tablet or whatever, but some of you might have a, a copy of the Bible, hard copy of the Bible. Well, if you've if you got a hard copy of the Bible, take a hold of it right now, and if you don't, and you've got a Hold your phone. It's on there somewhere. So, Inside this book alone, that's what I'm talking about. This is the way. All scripture, that's this book. 
that's every bit of this book, but nothing else but this book. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction of righteousness that the man of God might be perfect and thoroughly furnished into all good works. What's for that? That's the book, the Bible. Not the Bible plus other things, or not by certain sections of the Bibles without part of it. This book, all Scripture, that's what we're talking about. The Word of God. The way to know what God's plan for your life is, is in this book. And there's not another way to find it. This is the authority, and um, this will always be uh, the basis of judgment. When we stand before God, and we will, you will. Uh, I'm not singling anybody out. It's not I'm putting something on you that's not on everybody else. Everybody will stand before God. The books, that's a plural, the books are open. One of the books is open. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. It's like a roll. And when they say when the roll is called up yonder, you remember that old song? That's what they're referring to. The Lamb's Book of Life. It's the roll. Whosoever's name is not found written in the Book of Life will be cast alive into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the Antichrist are. So you want that name? You want your name in the book? The other book tells you how to get there. The books is the Lamb's Book of Life. That, that's the role. But the basis of judgment is the Word of God. It is the Holy Scriptures. And we will be judged according to that. In the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away. I kind of get amused about men because they really think they've got a plan about heaven and earth. Uh, I, 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 I kind of have a, a fascination, an appreciation for Elon Musk. I, I think he is a very brilliant man. Not, not, I'm not saying he's righteous or evil. I'm just saying I think he's very intelligent. You know, he's planning to colonize Mars. No, no, I know people write fictional books about space travel and so forth, but literally, Elon Musk has a plan. Not just to go to Mars, but to colonize Mars. Well, I got. Well, I guess that might be a pretty good idea if this Earth is going to pass away, and it is. But Mars is going to pass away too. Heaven and Earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my word will never pass away. When 10,000 times 10,000 of the, the life period of our son has passed into an eternal past, the word of God will remain. And we can stake our, not only our life, but we can stake our eternal, immortal soul on the validity of the word of God. So... I, I want to impress upon you the importance of believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. But the third thing I want to tell you is, and seemingly this is the most difficult thing for people to grasp and believe, but it is the most important of the three. And that is that you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And everybody must do it individually. Um, quite simply stated, Gospel of John chapter 3. Everybody knows verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The most beloved scripture perhaps in all the Bible. But earlier in that same chapter, chapter 3, verse 3 says, you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. And that refers to everybody. There's not someone that is so good that he doesn't need Jesus. There's not somebody that has given enough that he doesn't need Jesus. There's no one who has accomplished enough that he doesn't need the Son of God because this is universal. 
It is universal. Everyone that enters into eternal life must be born again. Nicodemus, the Jewish leader that Jesus spoke those words to, was dumbfounded by the concept. How do you do that? How can you enter a second time into your mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit. We're talking about our spirit living forever. Our spirit must experience a new birth if we have hope of everlasting life. Jesus uh, According to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. You talk about, well, I, I pursue, I want eternal life. You'll find that the only way there, the road, the way is Jesus. No other way to arrive at that destination. A person must be born again, and the way to be born again is through Jesus. I want to read a passage of scripture to you now from the book of Romans, chapter number 10. And uh, Paul says in verse number 9, chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If a person would seek the way of eternal life, it is capsulized in one verse of scripture and explained in the next verse where in verse 10 says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Folks, I'm, I've given you the, most three, the, the three most important things, the three most important truths that you must hold dear if you have hope of everlasting life. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Christ. That the word of God, the Bible, is eternally true. And it's the basis of the final judgment. And finally, a person must believe on Jesus to be saved. And there is no other way. Now, people have become way more broad-minded these days. Have you noticed? The more we become educated, the more broad-minded we come, and we realize that although there are some 4 billion people on planet Earth today who call themselves Christians, 4 billion, that's, that's a good crowd. Um, we also know that there are other religions that number into the billions. I, I mentioned Islam a minute ago, but along with Islam, there's the Hindus. Um, along with the Hindus and um, the Islamic religion, there is uh, the, the Jews. The, these five principal religions today make up about 95% of the world's population that ascribe themselves to one religion or the other. And someone says, surely you don't believe that the Christians are the only way, that, that the Christians are the only ones that have found the way to salvation. No. I'm telling you that Jesus is the way. He's the way. But there, there are folks that have called themselves Christians that didn't ever find the way. Only, only one way. And uh, so you might be thinking, well, you need to be a little bit more broad-minded. I'm going to tell you what. There are a lot of broad-minded people today. Jesus told us about them. He said that broad is the way. 
that leads into destruction, and many there be who find it. But it says, straight is the way and narrow the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find that path. And uh, I, I want you to know that uh, the whole plan of salvation was designed for you. Um, God never had a plan to, to exclude you. So someone felt like they're behind the eight ball and everything's gone against them their whole life. I want to tell you that the plan of God has been to make a way for you. Um, Peter tells us that God is not willing that any should perish. Some people think that the will of God's always done. Don't worry, the will of God will be done. No, the will of God's not done a lot of times. The will of God is that no one be lost. Yet people get lost because they don't follow the one way. And so I'm just here to tell you today that whoever you are in the plan, it's in this book, it was put here with you in mind. This plan of salvation was designed to include you. And I want you to be a receiver. For Jesus' sake and for your own, I want you to hook up with God's plan. These three eternal truths. Heavenly Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would open our eyes of understanding that you would speak to our hearts and that you would change our lives today for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, we're, we're, I want you to keep your heads uh, bowed and I want you to just remain prayerful, eyes closed. I, I want to promise you today 